program booklet. Yes, this, this session is also recorded. And now uh, I would like to, because we don't have a lot of time, just dive right in. And um, we are here at the Science Communication Forum and we've heard a lot about science communication, um, but not by accident, this panel is um, labeled science engagement. So I would like to kick off our discussion by asking our panelists as, as a group, actually, uh, what does science engagement mean to you? What does it look like to you? Maybe in contrast to science communication or like what can it add to it? And um, yeah, I'm, I, th I think I would like uh, Sarah to kick it off. Thank you, Nicholas. Can you hear me? Okay. So um, to me, uh, the science engagement uh, is that um, um, everyone feels comfortable or safe to express the opinion without hesitating in Japan. Like in my experience in Mirai Kan, like I talk to many visitors and then some of them seem uncomfortable to express their opinion or what they think. Um, for example, when I ask if a visitor have got a COVID vaccine, the person seemed ashamed and say uh, no. And another example, when I said, um, what do you think about this exhibition, for example, uh, the visitor said, um, I'm too stupid or to understand. And so there's nothing to say or stuff like that. And from this experience, I feel that some people in Japan think science is for intelligent people or like they should, like people should act in a way that seems um, scientifically right. So I hope that situation will change in the future. And also I'm working in Miraikan as a science communicator, but as well, uh, also I am a science scientific illustrator. And I think I can use my illustration uh, to make it easier to express their, their opinion because I realized that the way the researchers see my illustration and the way I see my illustration or the way I see the research and um, the way the public see my illustration is quite different and it would be easy to how to say make a comment on the illustration so yeah I hope I can do something to encourage uh, science engagement in Japan thank you those are all great points. Sorry, right. to me, I, I always think of this, uh, the engagement pieces of, around um, inspiring and encouraging people to think about our world in a different way and to share the excitement about all of the great science that's all around us every day. It, you know, obviously there are benefits for, for getting people engaged to become scientists, but I think even outside of that, it's an amazing opportunity just to share the wonder of the world and to get people excited about thinking about things in new ways, whether they're scientists or not. If you think about, um, because I think that is something that uh, I think a lot of the people we heard today would agree on, uh, because I think either, either it's a communication or engagement, but like what if you would carve it out a little bit more, what would be the engagement aspect? Um, maybe Shane, you could add. Ah, sorry, we don't hear you. I, uh, I was misinformed about the space key working to unmute me very much, apologies. Um, I think one of the most important things about the idea of engagement is that it is very much a two-way process, a two-way process um, that shares the, the benefits and activities of research um, between scientists or, or other researchers and the public. But the other crucial aspect of it is about mutual benefit. It's about benefit both to, to the public and to the scientists or researchers who are doing the public engagement, and that ultimately will make them better researchers if you are closer to the public that you're researching for across a whole range of reasons. 
The other aspect, which when I think of science engagement and where it's personally important to me is what both Sarah and, and Douglas have said about, um, about people thinking scientifically and feeling as though science can be something for them is that it will improve a lot of people's life chances, their opportunities in life, both from a career point of view, but also just from a life point of view. You know, it's the, uh, a decision made using scientific processes, even if it's not entirely that, is likely to be a better decision. Ah, sorry, Edna. Uh, I think we can also not hear you. Sorry. Um, I also would want to add something about what I think about science engagement. For me, it's getting science out of the lab, out of the academic um, spaces, and taking it out to the marketplace or to the normal spaces where everyone is the end user of the science scientific results. And that way we are able to interact with everyone in the community. Science is meant for everyone. We should reach out and get it where it belongs. There's one more thing I'd like to add to that as well, just so there's complete clarity on the matter is that science engagement is something done by scientists, the people doing the research. It's not something to outsource to another professional cadre. Use specialists in science engagement to facilitate your work, to help you do it more efficiently, to do it more effectively. But it's, it's so important that scientists themselves are actually involved in doing the engagement. I think that would fit to uh, also what has been said by Massimo um, Bucci, uh, and at his keynote where he said, like, actually, the when you look at the numbers of trust, um, for example, scientists are way more trusted than journalists, like the and really by a huge percentage. So really, like giving um, scientists this task of like uh, promoting their own own science or communicating it, engaging people, um, Mohammed. Uh, can you maybe give us an, um, a very concrete example of how you're doing this engagement work in your field? Yeah, I totally agree with our colleagues here um, and Shane uh, for this important uh, note that science engagement is done by scientists and researchers rather than to have a mediator between um, the scientific community and, and the lay public. And uh, I have to say that most of the universities uh, like uh, especially in the UK, uh, where I got my degree in science communication, it's like uh, they have this department called public engagement, which uh, will increase the credibility and trust about their work. Because after all, uh, these public universities, uh, they get the fund from the taxpayers and the taxpayers need to know where their, mon their money goes. And uh, that would increase this kind of uh, trust that we need uh, uh, from the public. Uh, one, one of the activities uh, I've been doing, I've been doing this field of uh, community-led projects for the past uh, 12 years. And uh, mostly I, I found that inclusive science engagement is really important because uh, some, some uh, communities are considered as neglected sector of our society uh, or market as underserved or a marginalized group. And I think, uh, uh, one of the activities I was work, one of the projects I worked on is called the Fun Lab, and this is back in Egypt. And uh, I think Egypt has uh, one of the problems is seventy percent of the high school students they choose they tend to choose uh, art and humanities rather than science because just for the fact that we consider science as a luxury and it's not for them, and science is hard and there is a lot of financial burden comes with. Uh, if you pursue a career in science and if you study uh, science uh, in higher education levels. And um, I, the Fun Lab project that I worked on uh, was meant to reach out to these, um, what we call the marginalized groups and trying to change the perception about science to be more positive and uh, to give them access to the knowledge of science that they, um, that they don't have before. Uh, so basically, 
we've been running this what we call science bus uh, basically to reach out these remote areas in Egypt and trying to reach them with different science engagement activities uh, where we can hopefully inspire the next generation uh, to to pursue a career in science and engineering in the future. But uh, other, like, I mean, now uh, Mohammed has described one target group. Uh, when when you think of like, what are other groups excluded, and like, where do you reach them from from your experience and in your in your daily work? There's a piece of research conducted in the UK by Professor Louise Archer um, at the Institute of Education at UCL, it's called the Aspires Research. And I strongly recommend everyone Googles it, looks it and, and reads up about it. It's a wonderful um, longitudinal large scale cohort study of the attitude of young people in Britain towards science and, and STEM subjects. So they've also done the most amazing job of, um, of uh, spreading that research in terms of translating it into to lay language that, that educators and outreach engagement specialists can understand and make use of. In short, what that research says is that in the UK, around about 70, 80% of kids think that science is great, it's wonderful. Um, they don't really need to be inspired so much about science, they already are. But only 15% of students think that science is something for them. They think um, that the 85% the think it's for other people. And Louise and the team identified um, a whole host of reasons why that might be, um, or rather characteristics of children who thought that science was for them or those that thought it wasn't for them. And some of those characteristics are very educational, but some of them are much more in our field as, um, as educationists and, uh, and engagement specialists, such as, um, you know, a child who's, who talks about science outside of the classroom is far more likely to think that they could be a scientist. Um, the child who knows scientists, um, often through parents and parents' families, are much more likely to think that they could be a scientist. Um, what's also interesting is some of the things that put those students off being scientists. And one of the key most embedded factors is the thought, the perception that science is just for brainy people. And um, that's a really hard perception to kick because uh, in the UK, and I suspect most places, we're aware of this perception um, and have struggled to do much to shift it over the years. Uh, it, I always find it quite ironic, though, that uh, when we look at who we send out into schools to do outreach, they tend to be called doctor so-and-so and have a PhD after their name. So again, when it comes back to who does engagement, I would also strongly suggest that not only do you researchers and academics, but support staff and technical staff um, also get involved in engagement. There is a, a role to play for everyone involved in the scientific process to, to be involved. So who do I think is being missed out? The kids who think that science isn't for them. I, I would like to suggest if we can uh, maybe identify these three buzzwords in the field of public engagement and science engagement, they are the equity, diversity and inclusion. And I, I would love to hear like some thoughts from my colleague about what equity, diversity, inclusion would present uh, to them. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. This has been a, a very, very hot topic in Canada for the last you know, five to 10 years in particular. Um, you know, everything from the government straight on down to every strategic plan that we write, one of the core tenets is always um, is EDI, and in our case, D, um, the D being decolonization, because in Canada, we have a long history of um, of poor treatment of our indigenous peoples. And so this has been a, a very, very large focus in everything we do within the university system um, and largely within our within our, our society, which of course has led to a degree of comfort, uncomfortableness, which is really important and really needed to be able to have the, the hard discussions you need to have to move forward. Um, 
but you know, I think when you ask about what EDI is to me, it's about being able to present a future um, that is open to every possibility to everybody, regardless of you know the background you have, the you know the physical situation, mental situation you're currently in, your you know race, sexuality, gender, etc. Um, you know, and I and I think really the most important piece of that within the context of the discussion we're having today is that you know we are really for one we're in a really global world where we need to be able to understand each other um, to build the trust that was mentioned by, by Shane earlier or to come up with the the answers to the biggest questions that we're facing like it, it's going to require that we work together to solve big problems like you know climate or um, gender inequity or uh, or whatever your, your your big challenge of the day is. Um, and I think the more minds that we bring to the table um, who bring their own lived experiences and their own, their own um, you know, backgrounds, education, uh, knowledge, you know, interesting little tidbits they've picked up based on the the way they are perceived within their world is the only way we can really truly move forward to to try to to address these big things. Yeah, that, that's really interesting, actually, because uh, a lot of people like the, they tend to use the word equality, and equality is really important as well. Uh, it's sometimes interpreted as treating everybody the same, but I think equity is, is more important because it's recognized that different people will require different kinds of support in order to access the same kind of opportunities. And uh, you uh, describe the vest and inclusion in in a great way. And I think I totally agree with you, but I think diversity by itself just is not, if it stands alone, it's not enough. It needs the inclusion part as well, because I think diversity is only one, uh, like uh, it's only a box ticking kind of activity if there is no real inclusion in it, because inclusion, I know in practice, inclusion can be more difficult to put into practice because uh, as we are often unaware of the barriers uh, that we put in front of us, us, or what we call sometimes the unconscious bias. And uh, so, yes, I, I totally agree with you, Douglas. Uh, that's, uh, that's very interesting. Maybe now um, that we have talked about what engagement is and, and also like who we should include, um, and, and that's already a challenge for, for science, right? But um, if you look at the science enga engagement sector and like your uh, personal work experiences, what are challenges you're facing in promoting the sector to like, grow in your countries? Maybe Sarah, you start, uh, you can start. Okay, let me share uh, the story. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can. Okay, so I became a ah, sorry. So, okay. can you? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. So in, in Miraikan, we have uh, a project. It's called uh, accessibility project, and we try to be accessible for people who is blind, who are blind, or people who are uh, hearing impaired, and stuff like that. And for example, we have a special tour for uh, deaf or hearing impaired people. And not only that, uh, like personally, I think, I believe I can, I want to create uh, the environment that um, um, no, no. the environment in which uh, people who met each other for the first time can exchange their own perspectives without like hesitating and you know visualize the difference dif how is it? the difference in the perspective I think 
sorry, does that make sense? Yeah, maybe just quickly uh, adding adding to mm. that is like um, now now that you describe um, the and I think that goes to the question before really like how how to be inclusive, but from your experience, kind of uh, pushing for these in inclusivity practices, is that particularly difficult or is you feel like there's a change over the the past years? I think we're trying our best, like we are trying to be accessible for everyone, but you know, um, costs, uh, how does it, the budget and human resources are very limited. So we need to decide how much we do to be accessible and ooh, how does it, for what kind of people we want to be accessible, you know, like, we have lots of uh, pe visitors from the other side of Japan, uh, yeah, the outside of Japan as well. So we need to, how to say, translate the Japanese into English as well. And, you know, so many things to do. So it's always hard, like challenge to decide how much you want to do and like which part we, you want to do and stuff like that. I have to say, say like, like Sarah, Sarah like, like um, I think in terms of diversity, uh, sometimes not all diversity is visible. Uh, things like disability and sexual orientation, among other things, might not be immediately apparent. And I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that uh, you mentioned uh, the accessibility part in terms of like diversity as well, uh, because a lot of people can miss, uh, recognize it, uh, because it's not like, sometimes it's not like there. Uh, uh, like at the first sight. Well, thank you very much. That's very inspiring. Uh, and let me add one more thing. And in accessibility project, it's easy to focus on like the people who need special care. But let's say the more we try to do something for them, the less I feel we care about the like normal people because here in Japan, like especially in school, um, students wear the same uniform and you know may how to say do the similar haircut or some stuff like that, and it's easy to forget everyone is different here in Japan, so. I'd like to, how to say, visualize the difference in them. Yeah. Thank you. I think, you know, so I, I come from a, a university communications background. So I am recognizing that we're, we're in a university. And I, I want to just weigh in really quickly that there's a need to be vulnerable and there's a need to be willing to make mistakes. And there's a, a a willing, uh, there must be, um, you know, a willingness to make a concerted effort. One of the things we I've done back home is I created a, uh, a national network of research communicators, and this has been a hot topic um, over the last over the last few years, is trying to push the discussions of how we can how we can do a better job of not only promoting science and promoting research, but how we can actually start to make tangible change in you know the stories we tell the voices we use and ensure that we are are taking more concerted and strategic not not strategic but concerted steps um to you know work out uh, a process whereby we are not falling back on our our conscious biases and i think one of the, the examples i'd have is there's a long legacy in canada of you know if you have a, a press story you call a female researcher, the odds are really high that they're not going to feel comfortable actually doing the interview. And it's just, a, it's a systematic thing back home um, where it's the culture of academia not, not creating a, a safe space for, uh, um, for women, as an example, or uh, persons of color or black individuals or indigenous scholars in, in our environment to, to stick their heads up above the rest. And I, one of the things that we've tried to consciously do is to reach out and, and strategically 
provide an environment where we're providing the training, we're providing um, the, you know, the, the workshops and the skills to increase their comfort and their competency in order to out do outreach or to do media or to do any other sort of science communication. Uh, Edna, I saw you nodding a lot. Uh, what is what is your experience from on the one hand Kenya, but also now that you um, study um, in in Japan? Like maybe there's even an interesting comparison. Um, in my opinion, I think inclusivity and the diversity is as diverse as we get because our needs are totally different depending on where you're coming from. And when we think about including or inclusivity, it, it depends on your need, depending on where you're coming from. And um, what is needful for me may, be, need, may not be a need to someone else. And for us, um, where I'm coming from, in Kenya particularly, maybe Africa, um, the female gender is, is quite excluded when it comes to the science engagement and more so the young women because um, there's no space for you to express what, what you have in mind or scientific findings or your thoughts, ideas, there's no space. And what we are doing, um, I am part of um, an organization called Mawazo, which has done quite some incredible work because they, they get uh, young, young women or young career women, uh, mostly doctors, uh, PhD students from different African countries. And they give us a platform to engage with each other irrespective of um, our various uh, backgrounds. Some of us are in climate change, people in medicine, but we have a, a platform where we are vulnerable, even we share where we share our own challenges in, in the field of science. And I feel um, that space is gives us a very good opportunity to share ideas. And now that I am here in Japan, the, the, the situation is quite different, very, very different. Um, because their need is may not be as as it is for us in Africa. Their need is different. What they want to include is di totally different from what we we who would want to to include in this this whole science engagement thing. But I am learning also to accommodate to accommodate and be as diverse as we can. Thank you. I, I would like to elaborate on uh, Edna experience uh, with the gender uh, inequality. So like it, in Egypt, as I mentioned, 70% of high school students, they tend to choose are in languages rather than science. And the majority of the 70% uh, are actually females. So uh, that's a problem Like when I, I noticed one of my visits to one of the uh, like underserved communities, uh, like we were two males delivering these kind of engagement activities. And, and after, after the talk, talk, after, after we finished, finished our activities, activities uh, like, like a lot of females, females like, like surrounded, surrounded us and came to talk to us and they, want, they told us like, oh, we want to be like you in the future and all of these uh, fabulous things they wanted to hear, but no, not a single female came to us. Uh, in contrary, when we invite them to come to visit us on the campus so they can get the chance to meet real scientists, to talk to real scientists. And luckily in the campus where I used to work, there was like female scientists. And I've seen from the first moment, like everyone run to the girl, the female scientist, like the, the, all the, the girls the, from the high school uh, level, they ran to the science and they started talking to them. And I was like, oh, how, how it is like to be a scientist. We want to be a scientist like you. And it's like, you find this kind of thing. So there is tremendous hunger from, uh, from them towards science, but they're not given the chance of like, oh, okay, can we be scientists like males? Uh, that's, that's a problem I've seen in Egypt as well. And then I would like to now um, 
so we have been traveling, all the people here on this panel, we have been traveling um, together through um, Japan, Tokyo and Okinawa, and, and really experienced the um, uh, science communication, science engagement uh, here. And uh, I mean, we, uh, we know that it's lived and practiced very differently in each country. If now you were asked um, to consult, let's say the Japanese government or uh, the respective department on like what next steps to take. What would be your like one learning from back home where you say like, don't repeat that mistake. Um, like what, what do you think um, to set uh, up science engagement in Japan like really well? Like what, what would be your thoughts? Like um, maybe Shane, you start. Uh, think long-term would be the first thing. Science engagement, as um, the professor this afternoon said, is a long-term process that you need to have in place over the decades. It's not something you turn on when the crisis hits. It takes time to build relationships with um, communities. It takes time for scientists to build the skills that they need to, to be engaged. Um, so that's the first thing is, is think long-term in these multi-year campaigns and projects, uh, look to other countries where the research has been done to discover the sort of underlying research and literature um, on, on science engagement, uh, what's working, what's not, and, and take that time to work long-term, build the relationships, build the skills, let people have contracts of more than one year. That's an easy one to say then. What do the other I, thing? And I, I'm always hesitant to come in and say, hey, you know, here's what I would say in the sense that really what I would start with the question of what do you want to achieve? Um, you know, what's the goal? I, I'm certainly not going to be so paternalistic as to say, hey, you know, here's how you should how you should do it, given that the cultures and communities and experiences are all very different in every place we go. Um, you know, but I, I, you know, I've seen some, you know, you, you've got opinions to change, then you're going to have to do, you're, you're going to have to put in the work to get people to build the trust and to build the relationships. And like the point that Shane, Shane was saying, like, this is a relationship-based world. And, you know, that applies to most things that we do. Um, but in communication, you know, you can't build trust without building relationships. Uh, I would start there, but I, I would really also just, you know, it all depends on what the goal is. Um, you know, I would have my own goals for advancing science communication, um, but I recognize very well that my week in Japan does not put me in a position to, 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 to make, to, you know, really be able to provide clear advice uh, in here without asking questions first. But then maybe if you turn it around, uh, Douglas, like um, just looking back at, um, and you have 20, 20 years experience, right, in Canada, like what was something that you found frustrating and you wish, or like you wish better for the for the future? Well, you know, I, I, wish, I wish a lot of things. And unfortunately, I've seen an erosion of, of trust in, in research and in science over the last, you know, five to 10 years in particular, which is, is incredibly frustrating. People care about this stuff. They, they are excited about science, um, but there is so much competition for the space in people's heads right now. And then there's so much information out there. You know, it's, it's a great opportunity for us that we can find out anything we want at our fingertips. But at the same time, if we're not providing the skills and experience for people to moderate that information, it can spiral out of control pretty quickly. Um, you know, and I, I, I would say, yeah, you know, <laughs> relationships have been everything for driving what I do, but, you know, to, in order to build trust, but provide the opportunity to show how exciting and how cool this work is, um, you know, you can really inspire, uh, you know, especially at a young age, you get, you get something in somebody's head. We all know that children, you know, they latch on to things that are really exciting and really cool. Um, I've always tried to do that. You know, I always try to blend art and science to get people to break down those barriers that people see. You know, we talked earlier about, um, you know, science being hard 
And sure, yeah, you know, life is hard. Science is hard. Um, but it's also incredibly rewarding and incredibly exciting. Um, and I think that first step is how you break down that barrier. And that's been my goal through everything I've ever done. Like I, like I, you know, I, I laughed walking into, into the college here or the university here, sorry. Um, and you know, the images, you know, the images of science. And it's like, I, I, I've done the same thing. I've done images of the future. I used imaging technologies to make art, to kind of say, Hey, you know what? Here's some really cool work. You can make it look pretty. And that gets people to actually read those two. What did you actually do to do this? Um, or I use cartoons in, in my work because, you know, you, you give that to somebody that's really disarming. Um, you're like, oh, I just thought, you know, university science or university research is just going to be this big, long paper that I'm not going to have a clue. But you make it easy for people um, and approachable to people. You've got a really good opportunity. We have um, one question in the chat uh, from Adam. And uh, thank you, Adam, for that question. And I think um, it, I want to just emphasize for everyone else also, like, please write your questions in the chat. We have a couple more minutes. Um, and Adam is asking, how can journalists and media represent scientists or their science info sources in a way that facilitates trust or comfort by the public? And since we are a panel on um, science engagement, I would like also to add maybe in this in this relationship between scientists and, and media, um, what uh, role as a facilitator can also engagement play? Anyone feel comfortable um, or uh, want to share something about that question? I'll jump in really, really quickly. Um, the challenge I have with this, and it's probably just a matter of wording, is um, it's not the journalist's role to represent science. It's the person trying to tell the story. Um, and I think this is where, you know, again, coming from the university background, is it's my job and several other people's jobs to ensure that um, our faculty members, our academics, our postdocs, our grad students are able to tell the story in a way that the journalists can report on it as opposed to advocate for it. someone else like to add all right okay we we have um also a statement or like a, yeah it's a question but a, um maybe a provocative one i think we will have something to say about that from ramsey is the idea that science is only for brainy people really a misconception research grants and research positions are very competitive stupid scientists don't last long what do you have to say about that who wants to would yeah shane <laughs> you know I'd, I'd ask how many people from art college are making money from art not very many um it is competitive research grants it is tough to to be in and to be at the top of your game uh, but it's not so much the, the problem that brainy people will succeed in science, brainy people succeed in whatever they're doing. Um, but the problem is that by creating this perception that it is really, really for only, only for brainy people, it means that a lot of people's options are cut off in life. And that is not right. There are also plenty lots and lots and lots of roles in science that do not involve writing grant applications you know it's people supporting it's people writing about it it's um doing administration I'm not saying those aren't for brainy people just to be clear but what i'm saying is that if you take the the position that science is about someone uh, applying for grants carrying them out publishing the paper then you are narrowing what science opportunities there are for people out there. Thank you so much, Jane. Uh, we have also a um, question from Christine, um, who says, um, oh, wait, it moved. I joined Twitter some years ago for its cycle access, but it has really shut down the propagation of tweets for people and institutions who don't already have 10,000s of followers. What are the best options for the future? Do we all have to get video friendly on TikTok or are there other venues where we can maintain and build collaborative networks? And I think um, all of you have like already found spaces and it's not necessarily maybe online, but like um, maybe Mohammed, you can also share a little bit um, about where you, you, where do you find your audiences for your science engagement practices? 
Yeah, uh, most of my work is, as I said, like community lead projects. So I actually reach them in, in real life, not on social media. But during the pandemic was quite challenging, you know, uh, because uh, most of our audience, our target audience, don't have the luxury to access to the internet or even having a, a multimedia device or even uh, have a TV in the house. Um, but for for some of them, like who have access to social media, we usually like if your target audience, like uh, younger generation, like Generation Z, this is what we call them. Uh, I think TikTok is really uh, handy in this regard. And I can share one of my experiences. Like uh, I remember when we started this initiative, uh, it's called the Street Science, and uh, we posted like more than hundred videos on on YouTube and Facebook, and we barely hit like thousand views after like maybe five or six months and then like with our first video on TikTok like uh, after 48 hours we had like more than 100,000 views and it keeps growing and growing and after a couple of months we, we have like million subscribers from this um, age and then like that actually started other opportunities that we they attracted more audience to our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter accounts and, and, and so on uh, to reach them out. But uh, again, as I mentioned during the pandemic, uh, one of the solutions as the Fun Lab initiative came, came up with is like for the people who don't have internet access, but they have like a, a computer device, maybe in their neighborhood or in the organization or their local school. Uh, so we asked one of the uh, NGOs uh, who do like door-to-door -door supplies, we asked them to tag like a flash drive or a CD so they can actually put in the computer and watch to some of our materials. Uh, I know this is not like a two-way of communication, but this is the best to do in terms of like the pandemic. Again, this is not my approach. I would prefer to go and interact with people and engage with them. Uh, but again, sometimes like science communication is uh, is a broad thing. It's like um, sometimes you use like the visual model, the top bottom uh, model. Sometimes you do the dialogue in two ways, but. Uh, like uh, again, like as we uh, keep discussing science engagement uh, is like, uh, it's a debate over terms here uh, to do with whatever science is being communicated at complex or with them, uh, with many activities falling in the former, of course. But I would love to see more uh, like science engagement rather than science communication, to be honest. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed. And if I'm not mistaken, then Christine is also here on site. So we, we can also continue that conversation later. Um, as we are coming to an end, there's one question that I would also like to use maybe as um, as a closing for, for this panel. So it's Alana or Alana. I, I hope that's somewhat correct. Um, and they are asking, apart from technical data. Do you think that stories and lived experience should be included as a form of data and decision making? And how can we convince scientists and policymakers to value these forms of data? I would like to give that a little bit a different spin. I hope that's okay for this closing now and um, asking each of the panelists, um, how um, do you in your personal work convince, convince scientists to be part of your engagement, and also what wish do you have for policymakers to make access to science um, more easy for everyone and also maybe uplift your um, science engagement uh, practice? That's a lot. Maybe you pick one of these and then we quickly do a, a run through the panel and, and maybe because you're sitting virtually next to me, <laughs> and I'll start with Edna. Um. What I would, I, would, I would maybe suggest the policymakers is to engage in participatory um, policy um, development where they, they consider the need of the people when making policies because sometimes what they think works may not be what really is important for the people. Even when it comes to funding, you might find something, fund something and yet that is totally crap for the people. So involving the people in decision making, policy making is very, very important. Thank you, Douglas, what do you think? Within the Canadian university sphere, I'd say to, to, to reward it or to fund uh, engagement, um, which is really a simple answer, but uh, you know, faculty members and, and 
again, and postdocs, grad students, et cetera, they all have full plates. And, you know, it makes the long list of things to do, but it doesn't necessarily make the part of the list that gets achieved uh, regularly, in part because it's it, the, the benefits aren't always immediately obvious. Um, you know, we're seeing back home, you know, the need to include knowledge exchange plans, for example, in grants. You know, there are opportunities around science engagement as well. Thank you, Sarah. Sorry, can I ask what is the question again? <laughs> no worries, no worries at all. Like if you would like formulate one wish oh. for like uh, your work eventually being easier, like what would this be? Is it working? I think Sarah froze, but I heard the word networking. So that maybe is also like one answer that we could take until she is like back with us. Um, Mohammed. Yeah, uh, basically, oh. I would uh, suggest like we need to challenge sometimes our own assumptions and biases and maybe reimagine what successful engagement looks <laughs> like to ensure that the needs of our communities, the communities that we serve, are our primary focus. As simple as this. Perfect. And then, Shane, you, you got the last words. I get Sarah's slot as well. Uh, your first question was about how do we convince policymakers to tell stories, tell stories about people who have been affected by science engagement that we work, and then back that up with the quantitative data to demonstrate that those experiences are representative, that they're happening in lots of different places. And that's what we do um, to um, encourage policymakers to make the right decisions in, to carry on funding us, for example. Um, but what do I want? to happen um, within the, in the realm of science engagement. One of the um, counterintuitive things that I've noticed in the UK recently is that the more we spend on science engagement, we are actually increasing a form of inequality. And that is most universities spend their engagement efforts in their locality. We did some research which basically showed that a school 30 minutes drive away from the university was half as likely to be visited as a school 15 minutes drive away. Too much happens just locally. Half the schools in the UK are more than 30 minutes drive away. Half the school population were not getting enough um, engagement. We are also at a stage in the UK, for example, where we have done lots of trial and error. We've worked out, we've researched it, we've evaluated it. We are at the stage where we are knowing now what works and why it works. And so we need to, to get to a stage where we are thinking more long term about making the activity we do more scalable, more effective and better evaluated. And in doing so, it will also be more efficient because in the UK particularly, that's going to be very, very important. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for these for these insights and numbers, I think uh, they're really enlightening. And um, yeah, we uh, this this has been now uh, also our panel already. I think we somewhat made it through this Zoom immersive experience. We lost Sarah, and we have uh, Mohammed floating as a bubble. But I think more or less, we I have, figured. See, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like I, I I breathe in helium, and that's why I'm floating. <laughs> Thank you all for joining this panel, for making the way to Okinawa to share your experiences and, and expertise. And I think um, I can really just recommend uh, for everyone who's joining us today to get in touch with them, to check out their profiles online. Um, and also there's a chance to see their fellow winners um, at the Engage pitches on 7th of November that's live streamed from Berlin. Um, and, and you can see there also some of the uh, best uh, science engagement um, today. Um, and yeah, thank you so much to our wonderful panelists, the ones that are still around, uh, but I'm sure Sarah can hear us as well. And, and, and yeah, um, thank, thank you all also for joining us um, on the audience. Thank you. And um, I hope um, you had a great day at the forum. And now for the closing, I hand back to, to Mumin.